Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. This episode features Christoph Gleisch. Christoph has over 20 years of investment experience. He started at Goldman. He worked at JP Morgan. He has a legit career, and he is now president and CIO of Harbor Capital Advisors. He evaluates managers through a factor framework to evaluate managers' skill. I think it's an interesting conversation. I was a little bit worried that it was going to be a little marketing-ish, but I enjoyed it very much. Disclose my bias. He is a man from Chicago. I love Chicagoans. Well, he's not from Chicago, but he lives in Chicago. And if you're from the Windy City, I got love for you. And that's just how it works. So as a listener, know that. This episode is sponsored by new sponsor alert, DeLupa. DeLupa was founded by a former hedge fund analyst to bring simplicity into the investment process. DeLupa offers an AI-driven single source for all company reported data and allows for investment teams to make the most informed decisions in the shortest amount of time. DeLupa scales the velocity of an investment team's idea generation. Analysts spend less time locating and manually inputting meaningful disclosures into Excel and more time synthesizing in the minutes after the print. DeLupa captures data from all company reported sources, including from footnotes, MDNA, and investor presentations. DeLupa's data sheets include gap and non gap adjustments, guidance, and all company specific KPIs. Each data point is auditable to the source for easy verification and accuracy. DeLupa's Excel plugin can also update your existing models for the latest quarter in just a single click. Bulge bracket banks and major multi-managers are trusting DeLupa for use in initiating coverage, building and maintaining industry dashboards, and keeping their models up to date. Visit DeLupa.com forward slash business brew to create a free account and learn more about how DeLupa can help increase your team's speed to differentiated insight. That's what I had to read. Now I'm going to tell you how I use it. The product has every single KPI that a company has disclosed through time. You might say to yourself, well, Bill, why did you accept the Lupa after you just told me to use Stratosphere? Here's how I think about them. Stratosphere is like a very, very legit prosumer product. The Lupa is a straight up institutional product. You get every single KPI that a company has ever disclosed. You can see when they stop reporting, when they do start reporting, you can scan the spreadsheet and see how things change. If I need to get up to speed on a company, thankfully I have access to Delupa because of the podcast and the sponsorship, so I'm able to use it. I check out a KPI, I click on the KPI, Delupa opens up another browser window, and I'm able to see the actual footnote that the KPI in the spreadsheet is citing. I can cross-check things. I can see units. I can see whether or not I understand what I think I'm looking at quickly. It's a fantastic way to get up to speed. And I'm happy to have them as a sponsor. And I think that for the prosumers out there, Stratosphere is a great solution. And for the institutional people out there, Delupa is. And that's why I'm comfortable with both as sponsors back-to-back. -back, and that's why you should be comfortable with me as a host. As always... None of this is investment advice. All of this is for entertainment purposes only. Please do your own due diligence and consult a financial advisor before making any investment decisions. Enjoy the show. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled to be joined by Christoph Gleisch of Harbor Capital Partners, is it? Advisors. Advisors. My apologies. My apologies. Harbor Capital Advisors, a Chicago firm. So I'm getting my biases out of the way. If the guy's from Chicago, you all know I'm biased to like him. It's just how it works around here. So know that as I go into the interview. So Christoph, how you doing? I'm very well, Bill. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. I, I am excited to chat with you. I, I understand you have a competence in picking managers, which I think is interesting. I, I think it's a very, very difficult thing to develop a competence in. So I'm, I look forward to getting into the conversation and hearing how you think. That's great. I'm um, looking forward to jumping in. And just so for your listeners who are probably listening to me and confused by your opening comments, I am now a resident of Chicago. That's not a natural Chicago accent? No, appar <laughs> apparently not. No, apparently they don't sound like this from these parts. But yeah, no, I'm from the, I'm from the UK. 
Yeah, you're going to have to learn how to say, what, what is it, Chicago, or however they, the hard A, but. I can, I know, I can say the Bears. There you I go. It's close enough. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so do you want to talk about your background, and I think we'll get into why you're from the UK and uh, your international past? Sure. So, you, like I said, I'm born and raised in the UK, grew up there, and I studied physics as undergrad at Bristol University, which I mentioned because I think it kind of shaped a lot of my thinking in, in my career as well. I, I like to sort of think from a first principles perspective, you know, using logic and generally using the scientific process as well in investing. And um, also what I learned, or what I have learned with time is, you know, there's a lot of parallels between physics and investing. I think people that haven't studied physics think it's this very kind of precise science, but actually it's it's full of contradictions and paradoxes and kind of conflicting data and information. And you sort of have to live with this all in your head at the same time. And it, your, the understanding of the world changes with new information as we get that. And, you know, in science, it's with new theories or apparatus to kind of to measure that. And, you know, I think in investing, there's a lot of that stuff going on as well. There's a lot of uncertainty, competing theories, and you have to kind of uh, be able to live with all of that in, in your head at the same time. So study physics, and then I uh, joined Goldman Sachs. I went to the graduate program at Goldman Sachs back in 2001 is when I began my career. Just for a point of reference, I began uh, on the grad program there a couple of weeks before uh, not the 9-11 tragedy. Oh happen so there's pe people are sort of shaped to a certain degree when their careers began so i sort of began with that tragedy and then in, in the teeth of a, a recession and a, a bubble uh, in the markets blowing up i spent eight years or so there and i moved after the grad program into gsam which stands for goldman sachs asset management that's where i cut my teeth in manager research so i joined the team there they were building it out in london and we, for private clients and institutional fiduciary clients, had to pick external money managers outside of GSAM. We were kind of ring-fenced off the rest of Goldman Sachs. And in 2004, literally knowing you know, nothing, hopefully I know something now. That's how I feel, by the way. I, I like that answer. Are, yeah. are you 75% confident that you know something now? Because that's about as confident as I get in anything. Uh, yeah, I'm a hundred percent confident I knew nothing then, and I'm <laughs> I'm I'm fifty percent confident I know something now. I like I it. Okay, something. Yes, something like that. you speak in my but, language. So I um I yeah. So I worked worked at Goldman. It was a great kind of training program, if you like. I'm not a very Goldman person, and I say that with the utmost respect for that organization. And I'm, uh, but I'm kind of glad I went through it. Like, I think it's good in life to do things that kind of take you out of your comfort zone. And I think working there and kind of growing up there and learning a certain skill set was good for me. It's a hell of a place to start. Yeah, it is. And right? look, to, be, I mean... to be honest, I was lucky to get in. I, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd get a job as a graduate these days. The bar just keeps going up and up and up. And I see how smart people are in our industry now. And I'm like, you know, thank God I was born when I was born and I managed to sneak in when I did. I have a feeling you'd probably be in now too, but I, I appreciate how you're coming at it. So what, look, one, of the, one of the things I'll talk about later is the notion of continuous improvement and that you have, you've got to keep continuing to improve every single year just to kind of stay where you are because this industry is so competitive. But anyway, cut my teeth at Goldman. That's where I fell into uh, manager research and picking managers. And I, I loved it and I still do. And that's generally kind of what I still do now and then I spent the best part of a decade also at JP Morgan, initially in London within wealth management, again, running their USITs platform. USITs are like kind of 40 act funds. It's the kind of equivalent for, okay. offshore, for offshore investors. So I ran a research team in London, pick, uh, picking the managers for the LATAM, EMEA and Asia private bank. And so it was a, glo a global role, got to do lots of travel. And then they asked me to move to New York and take over the global team. And I ran the global research team, the manager kind of solutions platform, which is a platform of about 500 billion of assets under management. So this colossal platform 
global in nature and about 60 or so research professionals as well. So I ran that for a few years. And then about four years ago, I, I sort of decided I was done with the big banks. I was like, okay, I've spent 20 years working now almost. And I feel like the big banks have extracted their pound of flesh from me and I want to do something different. And really what my passion was and is, was asset management. And it was, you know, working with different kind of boutique asset managers, trying to figure out like how you can pick them, partner with them. And what really always got me excited was finding that gem of a manager that you could position using client portfolios whether it was tied to a specific theme of the day or it was just a great long-term, you know, alpha generator. And um, so I joined Harbour four years ago and just a quick bit on, on Harbour. We're a, an asset management firm headquartered in Chicago, which is where, where, I, where I'm based. And we specialize in partnering with boutique managers from across the world in public markets, from equities to fixed income to commodities. We also run a multi-asset effort internally where we allocate uh, you know, different investments as well. So everything we do is public markets, definitely a, a leaning towards active as well. I've, I've, been an, I've been an active investor my entire career, and I, I know active versus passive is always a good topic as well. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a bit about me. Yeah. You know, how when you're at a big bank, it, it, it seems to me that it's a challenging mandate a to find how to pick managers that can outperform just period. But especially when you've got 500 billion of assets under management to, to find managers that can outperform and accept a lot of capital. That's like an even harder mandate. Yeah, I, for sure. So scale is that is gen generally the enemy of alpha. And scale is generally the friend of index or passive investing, right? Yeah. So if you, if you want to invest big numbers into markets and you want to be able to do it quickly and you want to be able to do it tactically, passive or index investing, they're not the same thing. And I'll maybe come on and explain the nuance because I think there is one. But um, you so you end up using a lot of passive for that as well. But then there are times when you want to use active as well. And, and, it's, and it's tough, right? If you're running... 500 billion and you want to move 1% in a portfolio, the math's pretty simple. It's 5 billion. Yeah. Right? Imagine if you're talking about small cap and you wanted to move, you know, a 2% position into small cap. You can't move two, you can't move 10 billion into small cap overnight. You can't do it the same week. It's going to take, so you have to be, you have to be very thoughtful with how you move in and out of positions. You have to work really hard to find managers that have enough capacity and you have to you have to just re meet reality i guess with where it is and so you probably use a bit uh, more sorry you probably use a few more managers than you otherwise would but you know we got creative about ways that you could combine managers so that you didn't get an expensive index at the end of it you know we use techniques to make sure that you've got still idiosyncratic alpha on top of you know a pure benchmark investment but yeah it was a challenge and it was always what i found working there at, especially at jp morgan i was either the best or the worst phone call a salesperson was going to get that year at an asset management firm why um, is that i mean the best because you've got a lot of money that you could potentially allocate right but why why the worst because we we're pulling our allocation yeah okay and, and it was just, you know, it was that it was it was tough. And my I was that bridge. It was quite a cool position to be in. I loved JP JP Morgan as well. I think, you know, Jamie Dimon is the man. And it was cool like working at two. That's, a, that's a consensus opinion. And I, I think consensus may be right on that one. <laughs> exactly. Like I, I I normally hate consensus, but like I was lucky. I used to go to 270 Park and you would see him around. And he'd be there on a Friday morning, kind of meeting and greeting people. He'd be there early. So I figured out what time he was there. And I'd always make sure, you know, I wasn't arriving too too much after him. But anyway, I digress. What was I saying? Yeah, I try to Jamie. walk into the building at the same time. Be like, Jamie, see, same schedule. <laughs> know me. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no, so he, he's the man. JP Morgan was great. 
And um, but I, I I forget where we were going with that. Sorry. Well, maybe. we started. We were talking about you're either the best or the worst call, and I think I think generally we were talking about allocating to managers with with that kind of scale. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's dead. It's it's the, it's 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 the 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 bigger you are, the harder it is. Is the sure. is the job to be done in that role? Is it necessarily outperformance, or is it also an element of hey, you know, I have five billion to allocate or whatever, and I have this top down view, and I want to get a, a number of managers that I think can express this view without taking on sort of the index passive risk? So it was a, a kind of a bit of both. So you'd have, we'd work with the chief investment officer uh, or the chief investment office of you know, JP Morgan's private bank that would kind of set all of the asset allocation and how they want to be positioned. And we would try and find building blocks to express and implement the views. And those building blocks would be a combination of passive and active as well. So we, you know, we'd have some managers that we held in those portfolios for, for years, if not decades. And it, definitely the job then was to perform. Like I was, I was paid on performance at uh, year end every single year. I had a performance scorecard. I had alpha versus a benchmark. And I had to try and generate alpha. And generally we did a, we did a pretty good job. There were there were other kind of if you like more esoteric or thematic ideas where there might be something a little bit more timely that wouldn't make sense to do kind of inside that core portfolio, and you would offer those to clients on an advisory basis. And so you know some of the examples during you know when I was in London during the European sovereign crisis we launched a European Opportunities Fund. It was a concentrated, long only, it was run by Alliance Bernstein, you know, the value shop, AB. And we had this kind of working theory that the proverbial baby had been thrown out with the bathwater in Europe because of the Greek debt sovereign crisis, you know, spilling over to Italy, Eurozone was gonna fall apart, et cetera, et cetera. But there's some pretty good businesses in Europe and trading a especially on global comparisons at ridiculous discounts. And, you know, these businesses, if you could kind of take a private equity mindset and buy these businesses and bring them back to the public markets in five years time, you could probably two or three X your money on an unlevered basis. And so we worked with a specialized stock picker like AB, and that would be a way we would then offer that to our clients as an SMA, individual SMA, 20, I think it was a 20 stock or maybe a 15 stock portfolio. And, but we raised like a billion dollars in that and it performed phenomenally well for our clients. But that was kind of like a, if you like a five year kind of special sit. And then, you know, I don't know, I'm assuming since, since then it's been kind of closed down and they've moved on to other opportunities. But so there's different ways that you can use, you know, active management as well. And I think JP Morgan were very good at that. They were very creative. You know, they had a very good investment platform of alternatives, you know, private equity, hedge funds and long only and trying to sort of steer those to where they saw opportunities to drive alpha was uh, when I was there and the sort of the guiding, the, the, the uh, bounding principle, if you like. So as I was researching a bit of what you do now, it it seems to me that and and I could be way off, so please correct me if I'm wrong. This is just from from background. It seems to me that Harbor used to run mutual funds on, yeah. on average, and you are now trying to turn a lot of the mutual funds into actively run ETFs. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd just I'd char- I'd recharacterize it slightly. Yeah, generally true. Like definitely seventy five percent. How I would describe it is traditionally we're a mutual fund shop right and we launched in the 1980s we launched our first mutual funds in 1986 and we actually came out of a an industrial company in toledo ohio owens glass like biggest glass manufacturer in the world Uh, we used to do their pension investing and we did it quite well and that explains our background of using external managers we used to pick these managers from across the world for our, for our pension clients. And then in 1986, 
we set up a mutual fund platform as a way of giving our plan participants an access point for defined contribution. So we're, the industry is moving from DB to DC. They needed a vehicle. Mutual funds were the vehicle. 1986, we launched it. Kind of that was the, if you like, the modern incarnation of Harbor Capital, and we did that successfully for decades. And we didn't need anything else, right? Mutual funds were the vehicle of choice. They they sort of been around, you know, the 1940 Act, you know, literally since the 1940s, and they've stood the test of time. You know, they've seen seen off every kind of crisis there's been in, in between then and now. But post the kind of the financial crisis, the industry really began to change and um, other vehicles came along. So for retirement clients, there's now something called a collective investment trust or a CIT. And then we've seen the emergence of the ETF vehicle as the dominant vehicle for taxable clients. And that began largely as a passive phenomenon and or an index phenomenon. And actually what's happening now is it's active management is kind of being, I don't want to say reinvented, but it's, 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 it's being maybe reborn into ETFs. And so what we are doing is we have a, you know, a mature mutual fund business that does, you know, does well, good managers performing. But about 18 months ago, we made a significant kind of investment and commitment, really, to, again, meet reality with where it is. And ultimately, look, it, for taxable clients, the ETF is a better vehicle, like, period. Do you mind explaining why? Because there may yeah. be some people that don't understand why. Sure. So there's a lot of similarities between mutual funds and ETFs. And uh, at the kind of the highest level, the similarities are you have a pool of common assets that is then broken into individual units. And you as an investor, you own those individual units that collectively own that pool of assets. And that pool of assets could be equities, it could be some bonds, it could be some commodities or whatever it is. So that's kind of like you're pooling your money together with other people and you all have kind of an equal claim on those assets is broadly how a mutual fund works and the ETF works. But the ETFs are cheaper. And so they're just for issuers like us, there's just less costs in, involved in, in running them. So just think of them as that they're a bit more of an efficient technology. And so we can pass on those costs to clients. And so they get the same thing that they got on the mutual fund a little bit cheaper. So that's kind of advantage number one. Advantage number two is they are more tax efficient. Now, I had to learn this because this is a US phenomenon. The tax system in un, full you know, disclosure, I am not a tax expert. And you must get your own tax advice. Yeah, yeah none, of, none of this is financial advice at all. This is just a conversation. Good. So, but according to the tax code for taxable clients, ETFs are more tax efficient than mutual funds. And I won't, I won't kind of go into why, except every year, if a fund has realized some gains and you realize gains by selling stuff that's gone up. So ultimately you, you want the gains to be realized because it means that people are investing in things that are going up in value but it means you have to pay tax on those gains. And a mutual fund investor or a mutual fund has to distribute those gains at the end of every year, and then you pay, depending on your income bracket, you pay a tax rate on that. With an ETF, there is a way that they can trade securities within the ETF that the gains are not kind of realized by the fund itself, and they are sort of passed out to the, to the investor that's kind of leaving. So they're more tax efficient. So if you take two parallel universes and you do the same thing in a mutual fund or the same thing in an ETF, it, for a taxable client, the taxable client is going to have a better after tax return. And then there is the third element is- The way I've always thought about that, and it may be improper, and again, really do seek out an, an expert, but I've always thought with the mutual fund, you sort of have a look through ownership interest in the actual securities and in an ETF, the way that that- the tax code thinks about it is you just have the ownership in the ETF and the ETF is allowed to sort of churn things without creating taxable events for you. I'm sure it's not right, but that's kind of how I think about it. 
I, I'd say I'd say broad, broadly right. And the way that ETFs, so when you trade with a mutual fund, you have to give it kind of generally like cash or take cash out. When you trade with an ETF, and you, your listeners probably won't see this, it will be a trader or a market maker on their behalf, but you can trade securities back and forth to create the units or take the units away. And by having that securities exchange with the ETF, you're able to make the ETF itself more hmm. efficient. There you go. And it's 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 one of those like really complicated like ecosystems that exist in the world, and there's like thousands, probably tens of thousands of people responsible for making this happen real time across the world every single day, and you never even kind of think about their existence because it just kind of happens. But we're all glad that they do exist and that we're able to kind of have this infrastructure. So then, and then transparency. You, you touched upon this. ETFs, you have to look, you have to show daily transparency. We've found uh, investors prefer more transparency than less. And with a mutual fund, there is less transparency. It might be on a monthly basis with a 15 day lag or, you know, perhaps even less than that. And so there's a transparency element. And generally, I, I know I, I think more, more transparency in life is generally better than less transparency, whether that's applied to ETFs or, or mutual funds. And then the last thing, so the fourth thing is timing. So you can trade ETFs intraday and mutual funds, you can only trade them at the end of the day uh, or transact in them at the end of the day. Now, I would say, I don't know whether this last one is a bug or a feature. It's a feature in that we like immediacy in life now and, you know, an Uber app rather than calling a local taxi company or hailing a taxi, yeah, great, get that. If you apply that to investing, it's um, it can it can create behaviors that are not conducive to producing better longer term results. I.e., we can sometimes be our own worst enemy when it comes to investing, in that you're chasing what's ju- you, what's just happened. And so, people like that feature, but honestly, I'm kind of like it's I, a six of one, half a dozen the other. Generally, we are all about long-term investing, have a plan, try and stick to that plan as much as you can, and so on and so forth. Yeah, well, this is the old, what do they say? You can buy a mutual fund with a load, which is objectively not as good as paying zero, but also a lot of investors will end up doing better in the load fund because of the behavioral biases that it reduces it's it's kind of interesting. I mean, yeah, I, I, I would know, need I to I would need to like pull the actual paper, but I, I'm I'm pretty sure this has been shown. Yeah, look, I hadn't I hadn't thought of that before, but you're probably right. If that you charge someone up front for something, there's probably a propensity to want to get as much value from that as possible. So you're going to kind of stick with that thing come hell or high water. And so I, I, I that doesn't that doesn't surprise me. I suppose it's in a way, you know. If you're invested in private equity or public markets, they're not really different asset classes. It's almost one of them is a behavioral correction and that yeah. it forces you to stay invested for 10 years. So the illiquidity of a private equity, maybe it should be, and Cliff Asness at AQR has talked about this, maybe it should be a premium rather than the discount. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, and market. especially when you think about the the role it can serve for allocators in everybody's lives to not get marked to market it it can create a simpler existence for for many of the participants so what was yeah. once thought of as a, as a bug may actually be a feature and we talking of mark to market we've had an interesting example of that in the last few weeks with what's happening with regional banks yes if only um, they were marked to model right that would be that would yeah, be a lot easier I'm, Going back to my old days at Goldman, I'll tell you one thing that was ingrained into me from, this is from like Hank Paulson and then Lloyd Blankfein from the very top. They used to say this at every town hall. We, you know, we are a mark to market firm. We are not a mark to maturity or hold to maturity. So I've kind of, I guess, you know, kind of always grown up, you know, mark to market was generally, generally a good thing. But, you know, you've seen what's that, what that's caused. I don't actually necessarily think the problem with what's happened with the banks at the moment is because of mark to market, but mark to market has certainly revealed some other practices that were otherwise happening. And again, it's created transparency, generating transparency is a good thing. 
Yeah, I, I, I have, I know just enough about this to, to be real dangerous with what I say, but it, it seems to me that at least in the banks that are on the, not on the brink, but I'm in Silicon Valley Bank broke, right? It's just one of those, the mark to market was kind of the, the thing that needed to come out to create the run. Yeah. But. I, I don't know. There's there's a world where those where those assets don't flee and this isn't quite the issue that it is today, but it's it's no doubt not great. Yeah, I mean it's it's probably the only example where we've taken an industry that's given money, lent money to a really kind of risky sector, taken on deposits and taken that money and put it into really safe instruments, and it's been the safe instruments that have kind of blown them up. Yeah, it's kind of kind of ironic, right? Yeah, right. It's kind of you know, it's one of those like it's a par- it's counterintuitive, it's a paradox, whatever it may be. But mark to market played its role. You know, technology played its role. If you think about banking regulation or any regulation more broadly, and with, I'm um, let me just say, I have full respect for regulators. They're in a very tough job, and I think our industry and and observers are, are quick to point the finger at regulators always and often. And I think it's very unfair because they have a tough job. But almost by design, they're chasing the last battle. So the regulation that we have today is to stop another 2008. It's not to stop another 2023. And so regulators are always fighting that last battle. And you know, when, they, when, they, when all of the regulation came out, you know, around creating the SIB structure and the, the stress tests and Dodd Frank, all of that kind of good stuff. It wasn't envisioning a world of social media, and I, we still call these phones, but they're you know supercomputers in our hands that you can then transact billions of dollars a day and, and move it without a moment's notice. And so there's a lot of you know any any time anything like this happens, it's a little bit like I don't know if you if you read on nuclear kind of reactor disasters and then you kind of read like the years later how did this happen it's never one thing it's never like this person didn't press that button at the right time and it's a it's a series of kind of independent but lower probability forces coming together and they're interacting in almost quite a chaotic way that creates this like non-linear spillover And it's the same whether it's a 2008 or what we're going through at the moment with the regional banking crisis, same kind of framework. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, had they, I thought, because I I was listening to a couple of First Republic customers talk the, the weekend that Silicon Valley Bank failed. And I thought the most interesting thing was the two gentlemen that I was listening to said, why are we sitting in deposit accounts that are risky that we're not getting paid for when we could move everything to treasury bills and make a lot more. And these two gentlemen were talking, I mean, they have enough to worry about this kind of thing. And that's, that's when I realized like, Oh, the entire business model of that, you know, basically that NIM structure of paying almost zero for deposits. I was like, this is going to cause some real upward pressure on deposit costs at a minimum, or or the deposits may flee, right? Either Neither of those are great scenarios for banks that yeah. were relying on low-cost deposits. And look, I, I think it's probably quite hard for an everyday consumer or cl- customer of a bank to have any sympathy, because I think people get really annoyed by how terrible the rates they earn yeah. in their checkings account are. Like what, you know, people in our industry call this the 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 the, the deposit beta. Yeah. Like, like, oh, great. Like, as if we need, but basically what it's saying is like, interest rates go up and that the interest on your checking account doesn't really move in any way, shape or form. And at the moment, it's because there's been a flood. There's been a, you know, deluge of deposits that there's been no kind of competition for deposits. Like people haven't needed them. So, kind of economics 101, banks, if they don't need deposits, they're not going to pay for them. And so you've had these deposits kind of sat at zero. And then in the last year, you've had historical, you know, increase in interest rates from effectively zero to 5% in um, in about a year, which is qu- the quickest we've we've seen, I think, ever, certainly in, you know, the last 40 years or so. 
And now that's created this big wedge between what you can earn in the bank or what you can earn in T-bills or what you can earn in money market funds as well. But what it's also done is, you know, we have an inflation problem at the moment in the world and in the US. And again, I, I'm, I'm sure your listeners realize this. And I was looking, you know, cost of soda is up 45% in the last three years. Yeah. Walmart, Kruger, and one other uh, that I'm blanking on mentioned in the word inflation over 100 times in their last quarterly earnings call. Like there is, there is an inflation problem. And now what we found with the Fed, which no one's really talking about, but I think it's an interesting point. Like the Fed have been committed to fighting inflation, right? Every time Powell comes out and speaks or somebody like, you know, do not underestimate our willingness and our ability to fight inflation. What this is actually doing is it's, it's putting a bit of an upper limit on their ability, not their willingness, but their ability to fight inflation. Because the old saying goes, the Fed keeps hitting the brakes until something goes through the windshield. Yeah, We've had regional banks like going through the windshield. And so I think now, actually, the Fed's hands are a little bit more tied than they were a few weeks ago or you know, a month ago. In, in fighting inflation. And that's actually a bit of a worry, but I, I haven't really picked up on, on that or anybody's talking about that so much, but I think they should be. The other interesting component, my man Bill Wabufo has been telling me about this. He, he had been pointed out, if you look at the average household balance sheets, they were in the healthiest position that they've been in in a very, very long time. So as you raise rates, you're actually kind of giving people raises. Yes. Which is interesting. Now, now I know it, you got to, you know, you want to see how that's distributed, but I think on average, that's a true sort of hypothesis. So it's, it's kind of weird how raising rates might be putting money into people's pockets, which could further inflation. So you, you're, you're hundred percent right. And I, I haven't done the analysis and it's kind of, it's one of those almost like meta questions when you start to think about it, because actually in the world. The world is a balance sheet for every asset. There's a liability. And so doesn't this all somehow kind of cancel out eventually? But generally, the economic theory is you put interest rates up to slow the economy down and you cut interest rates to speed the economy back up again. But what you're saying and that, that gentleman that you mentioned, but was it Bill? Yeah. 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 So Bill with, Wabufo is my, my man up north in Canada that gives me all my macro stuff. He's like my little macro analyst. So you, I, I, I like, shouldn't call you little. I'm sorry, Bill. <laughs> I like the fact that they have a different view and they've obviously thought about it. But yeah, look, balance sheets. One of the one of the um, challenges coming out of one of the facts coming out of COVID was domestic balance sheets were in better shape than than they had been in in a long, long, long time. And so you're right, those balances are going to be getting better. If they're in some kind of asset that's going to be earning them interest, that's going to be doing pretty well. And, and one of the things that I, I think has surprised people in this cycle is how long the economy's kind of kept running along for and how yeah. strong it's kept. I think if you had said to me in at the end of, let me get my ears right, at the end of 2021, and you had said, here is a crystal ball. Over the next 12 months, beginning in Q1 of 2022, interest rates are going to go up 5%. What's going to happen to the economy? Yeah, housing in... starts are going to completely collapse. Yeah. How's the economy doing? Exactly. And I probably would have said, <laughs> not, I would have said, but I'm not even going to answer that question because it's so ridiculously hypothetical. The probability yeah. of the Fed raising rates by 5% in a year is 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 as close to zero without actually being zero let's talk about something more realistic just being you know very humble like that is probably what my initial reaction would have been if you had then said look you've got to answer the question i would have said unemployment is probably going to be six percent i don't know six seven percent and you know well maybe we'll be in some kind of like mini depression and you know, the world's going to be in a really, really bad way. And oh my God, like there's going to be so much stuff that's just like breaking. I, you know, I, I would have painted a really bearish picture. 
So I think one of the surprises, positive surprises, has been the economic resilience in the face of high interest rates or an interest rate shock. Now, the the dilemma is, is this just kind of a lagged effect? Is it like Coyote, like, you know, coming off the cliff and before he drops? Or is the economy actually just much more resilient to interest rates? And that's sort of, you know, some of the some of the things that we spend uh, we spend time on. But, you know, so far, at least the consumer's balance sheet has given some much needed support. If you look at the balances in money market funds today, they're about five trillion. If you look at that as a percentage of U.S. GDP, it's still like that's a high number. And so there is still a buffer there. They are being drawn down, but it just might mean that the lag of interest rates slowing things down is more elongated than than before or than any kind of model showed. Yeah, so interesting times for sure. There's a, there's a lot going on in the world at the moment, which is very, we, the word unique is thrown around too much, but at the moment, there's definitely some unique things happening. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, we're off of a once in a generation or even longer pandemic, right? And how we all reacted. I mean, I don't think that's ever been tested. That said, I, I haven't, I don't think we've ever coordinated a shutdown. So or the reopening has been an interesting process. I, I, think a lot about the physics that I did understand was like the physics of the real world where I didn't do so well in physics was when I got into magnetic fields and stuff like that. But I think of things in potential and kinetic energy and P equals MV and what kind of force do you need to slow that? And I, I I just think we have a lot of momentum right now. And I think the other thing that's going on that's kind of interesting is I've been building this house now for, I guess, 18 months and it's still not finished. Yeah. So the, the starts completions matter and then starts matter. And I just, the, I, people that say this stuff takes a while, I think it may be taking a while. Right. And then, and then we'll sort of see how, how it all shakes out. But I think this is an interesting sort of tangential segue to what what you talked about earlier and and passive versus active or passive versus indexes do you want to get a little bit into how these how these the conversation that we're having how it may potentially not set up perfectly for the passive investor and how maybe an index or an ETF might be something that could be considered to uh navigate some of these risks Sure, but before I do, I just want to say how much I appreciate a bit of P equals MV. Yeah, man. You know, P P for momentum. I'm I'm digging I'm digging that. Yeah, I I like physics a lot. I just like I said, once I got into the electrical stuff and magnetic fields, once I couldn't see it and touch it, I I didn't do as well in it. But I, I think if I was better at that stuff, I would have actually majored in physics. Do you know? I remember my final physics exam was I had to derive the maximum efficiency from a like a windmill in terms of the energy output that you get like a mathematical derivation and i did it and if i had to do that now i i mean i'd literally i wouldn't even know <laughs> where to begin it's it's funny and just anyway i, I, like I you rest. lose skills you don't use right exactly exactly so let's yeah let's talk a little bit about that and the way i would sort of tackle that question is Let's look at um, a 60-40 portfolio, right? It's the kind of the 60-40 portfolio is the, the bedrock of our industry. And it's become this sort of conventional wisdom that you should always and always hold a 60-40 portfolio. And with, with good reason, because generally investors have had a really good experience of 60-40 portfolios. But there is a bit of an element that I think there's a bit of performance chasing and a bit of marketing about a 60-40 portfolio. Because I, look, I remember when I began investing and began in these markets like 20 years ago, people were not saying like 60-40 portfolio is what you need. Hmm. It, it, it became conventional wisdom kind of after it worked. Yeah, nice nice to do that through a period of steadily declining rates. 
Yeah, ex exactly. So look, if you look at like a, a 60 40 portfolio, and we'll look like after the financial crisis, right, we'll try and make it, they've worked pretty well since the early 1980s. There's been times when they haven't worked as well, but they generally produce strong returns. But since the financial crisis, they've done exceptionally well. And if you looked in the decade of the 2010s, a rudimentary, low cost, you know, passive, set it and forget it, 60-40 portfolio, returned about 10% a year, which is a very strong like outcome. And it produced 10% a year with very little volatility. And inflation in that decade, remember this, averaged about 2%. So a 60-40 portfolio produces 10% returns in a 2% inflationary environment, meaning on a real basis, aka after inflation, you're left with 8% a year. Wow. Like, what a, give me that sharp rate, give me that return and that sharp ratio like all day long. And there's, I think there's been this kind of embedded assumption that people talk about a 60-40 portfolio being a balanced portfolio. I would just caution to conflate 60-40 and balanced. It's balanced for certain environments, but it's deeply unbalanced for other environments. Yeah. So you contrast that with the 2020s. Like, let's try and like think in decades, you know, get a little bit away from the, you know, what's happening right here and right now. So a 60-40 portfolio so far this decade has returned 6.7%. Hmm. But in the inflation period, in, in the, the average inflation in the 2020s has been 4.7%. So doing the math, they produced a 2% return. So you've got an 8% return last decade, a 2% return so far this decade. And I just think that's really interesting that there's a bit of a dilemma that I think people have unrealistic and historically driven expectations with a 60-40 portfolio. You've had a flood of money go into it, and you've had a lot of, I guess, you know, consensus behavior, industry thinking driving into it, precisely in the decade that I don't think a 60-40 portfolio is set up to do anywhere near as well as it has done. You know, I, I can run through just a few things that the world is kind of facing now that I don't think it was in the in the 2010s. So I would say generally uncertainty today is just is higher. It's probably as high as it's been bothering the financial crisis in my in my career. You know, I, I heard the term poly crisis. The world isn't a poly crisis. Like I subscribe to the FT. They like talking about that. And it's like, okay, if it's not a poly crisis, there's at least lots of problems. Okay, the world has lots of complicated problems to solve. You know, I would say ge geopolitical tensions are higher than they have been probably in. 30 years. Yeah. You know, there is, there's, a, there's an ongoing war still in Europe. There is the fallout of the, I would say, brewing energy crisis that's leading to this insatiable appetite for energy independence happening across the world. There is this overall theme of deglobalization. Bill, you and I, we've grown up in a world where the world is only getting kind of more interconnected and globalization is increasing, not decreasing. But now I would say from a globalization perspective, the world is fracturing, potentially splitting into different poles, if you like. There are structural labor shortages that we just we haven't seen before. Yeah. There is, you know, you mentioned COVID and your your house. You said 18 months and still going. Yeah. Yeah. And I and people around here say that's quick. And look, from 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 what I hear, um, you know, it's it's the same everywhere. The the the, the supply chain issues from COVID haven't been resolved yet. So we've got a desire for supply chain resilience. I think you know we grew up in this world of globalization where the economic incentive trumped everything else. Yeah, and it was outsource everything to the cheapest possible place. And we'll run the world on a just-in-time inventory. And then we had, we had the, the pandemic that was a, a big shock to that system. And again, kind of going back to my analogy, you know, nuclear reactor break, there's these 
chaotic non-linear events that then ha cascade um, because of that. And we're still dealing with that. We're still dealing with that echo. And then we have now a regional banking crisis in, in the US, and it's not solved yet. You know, it, maybe it's disappeared off the front pages of the newspaper for a while, but it's still brewing. You know, that a lot of the banking system would be insolvent without effectively the Fed and the FDIC and others stepping in. If you look at the amount of kind of emergency borrowing or the amount of stress in the in the US banking sector and the regional banking sector at the moment, it's it's still high. And then we had, I'm gonna try and get my time here. A couple of weeks ago, we had a bailing out and a rescue of, for the first time in history, a strategically important bank or systematically important bank with Credit Suisse being essentially bailed out by UBS over a weekend. And for those, you know, the Swiss don't normally move quickly and they moved at lightning speed, which tells you what they thought about the financial crisis that would have been coming. And, and then we've talked to this about this as well, like the inflation problem. And I don't want to scare listeners because there's always, you know, one thing I've learned about investing is there's always a wall of worry that risk assets climb. You never wait for the all clear. And once you get the all clear, the kind of the easy money, the you know, returns have kind of been made. But just at the moment, the, that wall, wall of worry feels pretty high. Yeah. And so, so there's, there's a few things that, you know, I, I would say, we, you know, we, we like commodities at, at this moment in time. And we think commodities are the easiest and most efficient way for the everyday client or an everyday investor to introduce more balance into their portfolio. Okay, so I'm, I'm an everyday investor and I, I understand, I think I understand the bull case on commodity prices. It, it becomes a little bit more difficult once you get into how to express a commodity view. So if, if I'm thinking about the equity of a commodity company, then I have to worry about reinvestment risk. Then I have to worry about, you know, what does management do to get the cash back to me? Should it work? Should the, the bet work out? I, I was noticing one of your ETFs, it seems to use futures and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So is that a way that I can avoid some of the agency costs that I'm concerned about in equities, and do you have products that are like that? Yeah. So I, I, I let, let me give you like a, a can I give you a case study? Yeah. Kind of like yeah. Oh, let me maybe that's probably the best way. Let me spend a few minutes just describing a case study. So a couple of years ago, we you know we had the view that the next ten years are going to this is a different regime. It's changed, and we need to think about ways that we can protect portfolios. We can help our clients and, and customers protect their wealth. And um, we need to find something that's going to do better in, in a period of high and more volatile inflation. So we reached that view. And then the next thing is, right, you define the problem. And the problem is, we think inflation is going to be higher. What do we do about it? And then you look through the different asset classes. And we did all of this. And there's different asset class. I'll, I'll just sort of run through some of them and do a process of elimination is tips, you know, treasury, inflation, protected securities. The word is in the name. Surely they're going to provide inflation protection, but they don't. Yeah, they're on a lag, right? Yeah, it's on a lag, but it's also the um, they're affected by, you know, the real interest rate. So even in a year last year, like last year, sorry, where inflation goes up, the, the, the inflation bit of tips does well. It goes up in value. But the fact is that real interest rates spiked and, and there was a shock in real interest rates. And then that drags the value of tips back down. Hmm. And net, okay. net, you end up losing money. Now, are tips better than nominal bonds? Nominal bonds meaning normal treasuries? Yeah. Hell yeah. Like, yeah. Of, of course. But they're not going to give you that positive protection. They're going to lose you less money. Now, so, so we were like, okay, tips probably isn't the way to go. And then there's other things like real estate you can kind of look at, you know, cash flows linked to inflation. But we did the work on real estate. 
and there isn't a strong historical correlation with inflation and sort of real estate performance. We did the work on the energy equities, like you mentioned. Well, look, why don't you just buy the oil companies or you know, find find some basket of securities? And what we found there is it's a unpredictable inflation hedge because you don't know necessarily what the companies are doing in terms of inflation there. Sorry, hedging, not inflating, what they're hedging their underlying book. Yeah. Because if, if, if you've got a mine or a producer in order to secure the funding from the banks, they then need to hedge out the volatility of the underlying commodity of the new mine that they're looking to build. And so they don't necessarily get all the upside when commodity prices you know, go up uh, during periods of inflation. And there's hedge funds. Um, there's, a, there's an asset class called managed futures, which is a, a fancy name for trend investing. Trend investing does pretty well during periods of inflation. But what we found the best and did the best was commodities and sort of diversified commodities. And so we decided that was where we were going to spend our time and attention, right? So commodities. So then coming to more directly to your question is like, how do you access the asset class? And look, we're, we're not experts in commodities. I'm not an expert in, in commodities, but I do know it requires like technical expertise. And if you look at what commodities have done over the long run, the pushback from investors is they're very like boom and bust. And actually, when you need them, you probably go into them too late and then they underperform and like, you know, it's too much of a headache. Like, yeah. I don't have the skill set to time a commodities allocation. And so I'm not even going to try. So I'm going to go back to my tried and trusted 60 40 portfolio. And so what we've tried to do is we try to build a something that would allow for a more strategic allocation to commodities. So something that would have less volatility, less drawdown, still give you, you know, that upside and still give you that inflation protection. And so we worked with, um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have these different investment partners from across the world. And one of our partners is a firm called Quantix. And they are a commodities boutique, and they're based in the U.S. They're based in, um, in in Greenwich, in Connecticut. And the the founders of Quantix used to be the senior traders of the commodities trading desk at where Goldman Sachs. Yeah, and okay. Gold, Goldman was. This is the, the one that I looked at the prospectus of. Yeah, so Gold, Goldman were the biggest, or well, are the biggest, like commodities trading house, right? They bought Jay Aaron. In the early 1980s, that was actually famously how Lloyd Blankfein, who became Goldman's CEO, got entry into Goldman. He got rejected by their recruitment. He joined Jay Aaron, and then Goldman bought Jay Aaron, and then he worked his way up all the hmm. way to CEO of Goldman. He was like, how's that for recruitment? <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a really funny, it's a really it's funny like, story. Take that. Yeah, take, take that. Now sucker. I'm firing the recruiter. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. <laughs> But so they they they're they you know one of the biggest if not the biggest like trading houses of commodities and so we found we found found a team of exceptionally experienced experts in commodities and we sat down with them with this kind of problem that they were thinking about as well and we wanted to create a better mousetrap and so for accessing the head the 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 asset class and so what we ended up doing is with them. And look, they're really the brains behind this, but we worked with them in a very kind of constructive way on the on the design, if you like, of this. And it was to create something that would be a bit more all weather in nature and dynamically allocate two different commodities depending on the environment that we're in. And if I talk about commodities as an asset class, you really have to like double click on it and say like what's within what is commodities i mean it's it's food it's fuel it's precious metals it's industrial metals it's a basket of pretty different stuff and so to kind of just basket it all together and say just give me an allocation which is what a lot of what these etfs that do that exist today there's an index called bcom I'm sure everybody listening has heard of the S&P 500, right? Think of the BCOM as the S&P 500 for commodities in that it almost takes like a market cap slice of the commodities universe every year, and that's it. And that's very susceptible to these boom and bust cycles. And actually, there's very different commodities that you want to own depending on where we are in the cycle at the moment. 
And so we, we worked with Quantix to create an index that would dynamically flex different commodity allocations depending on where we are in the cycle. And um, then we created an ETF that tracks that index. So some of your listeners might say, well, look, that sounds like a passive approach. It's not. It's an index approach, but it's a dynamic index approach. In my kind of, that's, that's an active solution in my mind. It's just being delivered or expressed in an index product. Who chooses, how, who chooses what part of the cycle we're in? They do. Okay. They do. So they, they have these um, different indicators, like proprietary indicators, and the, the broadest kind of indicators of environment is, are we in a scarcity environment? Are we in a broad-based debasement environment? I.e., is there just too few commodities being produced? Or is it more there's too much money chasing things? Or is it a combination of the two? And what it does, and I think this is really important, is if you, if you look at gold versus oil, right? they're very different commodities with different characteristics. In its most simplistic sense, like oil is very if you like, pro-cyclical. Like if the world's doing well and there's lots of demand, like oil is going to do pretty well. Like it's a pretty pro-cyclical commodity. But gold is very uncorrelated to oil and it will do it will it will perform at different points in the cycle. And so we've got at the moment in our so our our um our ETF that we created, the ticker is H G E R, which stands for Hedger, and it's the, the harbor all commodity all weather strategy. And at the moment, it holds about 40% in gold. Hmm. And if you think about that from a hmm. how other people focus on this industry, they don't have as much in precious metals. But we've done the work, and we think to create something that is going to be genuinely a value-add diversifier to a 60-40 portfolio, it needs to be more flexible and it needs to, if you like, more aggressively add to precious metals when we think those are in favor and then scale back on those and back into things like, you know, oil and other more pro or industrial metals when it, when it should do that. So when it has less of a de defensive posture, it's going to hold, say, more copper relative to uh, gold and so on and so forth. And most commodity products do not do this. They just kind of give you a a slice of commodity markets, and they might try and enhance yield by taking collateral and investing that in higher yielding securities, hmm. which actually have nothing to do with commodities. So we, we looked at this, we weren't happy with what existed, and we thought actually there was a real need in the marketplace to create a valuable tool to help diversify a 60-40 portfolio. And so we launched Hedger last year, it's just over a year old. And it's, you know, since we launched it, depending on the day, it's up about 10% in the face of equity markets that I think are down about 15%. Bonds are probably down about 10%. So it's, it's really zigged when everything else is zagged. And that's essentially what yeah, that's why you have it. is, right? That's what, you're, yeah. that's what you're trying to do. Now, now it's not, it's not going to work all the time. It's not, it's not the, the panacea. Yeah. Past performance is not indicative of future results yeah. and all that. Yeah, or as I like to quote one of my favorite movies, it, it is not the Messiah, but it is, it is neither very, nor, nor is it a naughty boy. It's actually yeah. a very useful tool in a, in a portfolio. And, you know, we think gold at the moment is a, an area that is generating a bit more interest now. You, I, I saw today actually in the Wall Street Journal talking about gold now, which normally when it starts to appear on the front page of a newspaper means it's getting to the more mature phase. But if you if you look at some of the drivers, firstly, there's a lot of uncertainty, that wall of worry that I talked about. Generally, the higher the wall of worry, the better got better for gold, right? Yeah. It's just an asset that does well there. If you look at central bank buying, we have we're at record levels of central bank buying of gold. Now, you could one would argue this is a consequence of the war in Ukraine and the response to the dollar-based system in which we live, in that if you look at its sanctions and what's happened with Russia, I, you know, obviously I, I agree with everything that's, that's happened, but one of the consequences is I think it's causing 
some countries on the periphery that have had a reliance on the dollar-based system. Yeah, think twice about how to protect themselves. Exactly. And so like they, the, the, do you know the country that bought more gold than anywhere else in the last year? Oh, I do not. I should know this. Well, you, I, I, you shouldn't. I only found this out last week. I say it like it's this thing that I go around <laughs> thinking about all the time. Turkey. Mm. Mm. I would have gone so, with India. You know, that would have been my guess. And then Ru- Russia was um, was second, I believe. But there's there's a lot of support there as well. And then you know w- what we we had this real interest rate shock last year. It is very unlikely that that will be a headwind. And generally, if real rates aren't rising, that's supportive for gold because real rates is like a way of taking demand away from gold, right? Mm. It makes it less attractive. And then the dollar, you know, the dollar was very strong last year and all else being equal, the dollar's probably going to be worse this year than last year. And if you think about- I kind of hope so for the rest of the world. That was tough. The strong dollar exported a lot of pain. Exactly. And so you've- um, You've got other central banks playing catch up with the Fed now. You know, the Fed was first to move. They went hard and aggressive. The Fed's always the first to move. And now I think they're large, largely done. And now the other, you know, ECB and, you know, Bank of England, Bank of Japan, et cetera, and all the rest are going to play became catch up. And now actually you've got pretty strong six month price momentum as well. And so you're seeing more of like these managed future trend following strategies increasing their allocation to gold as well. And look, we we rebalance every quarter. So it's 40% today. It's been at about that for the last six months or so. We'll see what happens with the next rebalance. But it's just, I think, illustrative of where you can take a, you know, I mean, why I love this industry is like you can take a real life problem, how I describe. And then you can work with experts anywhere in the world. And if you're creative, you can bring something that actually has real utility to to people, you know, that want to protect themselves in, you know, in an inflationary period. And, uh, you know, we, we feel pretty pleased with with that as a as a way of sort of illustrating how we work. I think one of the challenges, though, is, yes, you can work with ex- experts, but picking which experts to partner with is is difficult right what i mean what are common mistakes that you see people make when they're when they're trying to pick an expert to work with or a manager or like what what what, i guess the most direct way of asking it is why should people outsource this to you as opposed to like trying to build it on their own so i think experience matters by the way it's not the only thing that matters but it's one of the key ingredients. So we've been at Harbour. We have been doing this for 40 years. Personally, in my career, I've been doing this for about 20 years now. And um, I've seen mistakes. I've made mistakes. I- I've hopefully learned from some of those mistakes. But what the, the hardest thing to fight against in our industry, in investing and in picking managers especially, is performance chasing. And investing is hard for two reasons. It's hard because the world is uncertain and you're dealing with imperfect information all the time and nobody has a crystal ball. And it's hard because the ratio of noise to signal is very high. Like you're just getting bombarded with- Yeah, all the time. Yeah, all the time. What feels like signals all the time. But it's yeah, kind of but it's like, just a bunch of noise. It's just a bunch yeah. of noise. Okay. And so to illustrate this, a while ago, what we did is we created the, um, I said no one has a crystal ball, so we decided to create one. All right. And we, so we created the crystal ball portfolio. And it was an it was a in, in, impractical, like uninvestable portfolio. It doesn't mean you can't learn from it. So what we did is we went all the way back to the 1990s. We just looked at U.S. large cap, right? We went all the way back to the 1990s, and we built the best portfolio with just investing in the best 20% of managers for the next five years. Like we looked, we looked at which ones did the best for the next five years. Said we'll hold them for five years, and then we'll do the same thing again. Look who does the best for the next five years. Rotate into them, and we'll chain link that 
as a portfolio. And we looked at it over 30 years and it outperforms over a 30 year period per year by, I think it was about 400 basis points. So 4% a year net of fees, which is good. And actually when you compound 4% over a 30 year period, like the, the cumulative difference is astronomical. Yeah, it's, it's huge. But it's like it's when you look at it, it's like it's four. I mean, you're like, huh, it's four percent. It's not like ten. It's not like fifteen. Even though I know the future, and you sort of you come away and you're like, oh, that's a bit disappointing. Um, and then you look at the sharp ratio and you look at the information ratio, which are you know various risk adjusted ratios, and the sharp ratio was 0. 0.75. And you're like, hmm, it's not. It's not one. It's it's definitely not two, and it's certainly not three. It's 0. 0.75. And then you look at the period of does it underperform? Like it can't underperform because it like it knows the future. And actually it does. And the longest period that it underperforms for is about four years. And so the reason why we ran this is it helps us set expectations before making any investment. It helps us go into something with a with a degree of realism. And that if the crystal ball portfolio can underperform over a four-year time period and it knows the future then so can an active manager that might be going through like a tough spot of performance so that's sort of that's a high level answer of of um, you know you've got to set realistic expectations you've got to have expertise you've got to know what you're looking for and i would say the way that we do that is you know we, we have a, a process that we refer to as the alpha edge and it's just our sort of process that means that we follow consistency in what we look for in managers and there is there is no silver bullet in this there's no hey if you just find a manager that has three people covering three sectors each with a centralized decision maker and they look for 20 percent margin of safety or 30 percent margin of safety and that's gonna there it's not that simple like each one is kind of more nuanced each manager has his or her own way of driving value. And I often feel like our job is to understand the world from their perspective, not, not our perspective, like try and understand how they're seeing value. And then what we do is we love to geek out and we look at quantitative and qualitative aspects and marry the two together. I think one of the mistakes our industry has made a long time ago is that you're either quantitative or you're either like discretionary or qualitative. You can never be both together. And actually, that's a mistake. The way that you drive investor returns is by marrying them, the two of them together. And so the way that we do that is we use reasonably sophisticated tools. We do things like factor regressions and factor analysis. And really what this is, these are fancy ways of saying, we want to try and understand what was lucky and what was skillful. And if you look at a, a long historical profile of a manager and it looks good, there's going to be elements that they got lucky on, there's going to be elements they got unlucky on, and there's going to be elements that they were just skillful or not skillful. And so we try and differentiate between, I, I don't want to buy a manager that's lucky and unskillful, but has just been luckier to date than they have been less skillful. Yeah. And so the, what the, the terminology is idiosyncratic alpha. So we really focus on when we're looking at managers, what is the idiosyncratic alpha? And you'll hear that phrase mentioned in multiple meetings at Harbor, in multiple settings. And that's kind of a bit of a true north for us as well. So we try and use techniques to discern luck from skill. We try and focus on idiosyncratic alpha which we think is more indicative of skill. And we try and not react to the factor-based stuff that's going on. Someone said to me on my team a few years ago, they said, look, factors cancel out and idiosyncratic alpha compounds. Hmm. And that's I like that as a framework. And so you get a lot of factor noise happening short term use factors to understand these drivers, but it's kind of that idiosyncratic alpha piece that's gonna compound over the long run. And we use these tools to try and make better 
longer term informed decisions. If we've done our work on managers, generally speaking, when they're going through a period of underperformance, it's better to add to them rather than detract from them. But it's really, really hard to do. Yeah. But it's gut wrenching. You feel like an idiot doing it. And um, if, if there are people, advisors out there, I think a really good best practice is if you're using some active managers, but you can extend this to regions, geographies, styles, go through, look at your worst performing things in the last year that you still like. You might be angry with them, but you still kind of like, like them and understand why they're there and just force yourself to add something to those positions. Yeah. And it's just it's a good kind of practice to um, to get into. So, you know, that's what we do. And we try, we spend a lot of time trying to focus on what that manager's edge is and what it isn't. And we, you know, we want to hold ourselves like, what? why do we think this manager has a durable advantage or a sustainable competitive advantage versus a very competitive industry to do better than that industry for the next 10 years, the next 20 years. So things like culture really come into it. I think I mm. mentioned this at the beginning, continuous improvement. Yep. And what we look for in cultures or firms that we work with are firms that hold a culture of continuous improvement. And that is they want to keep getting better year after year. You know, complacency is the enemy of progress. And there is a behavior that exists in money management in the, on the buy side. I think it might come from consultants because that's whenever I speak to anybody about what I'm about to say, they always like, I always blame consultants. <laughs> All bad things come from uh, consultants. By, by the if way, you like, ask if people. <laughs> if you're a consultant and you're listening, I, I promise you I've got nothing against you. I've worked with many good consultants in my time. But these these people, we'll just refer to them as these these people have said about consultants, that consultants don't like in, in investment management, they don't like change. And so if they're evaluating a money manager over the long run, it, if you've changed anything, that you will be given a ding in your process change, that you're, oh, there's style drift, or you've changed. or And in no other industry is it acceptable not to change yeah. and improve. Like I, I held this thing up earlier. Imagine if you said to Apple in, you know, whatever it was, 2006 or seven. Yeah, no more change. IPhone, Imagine if I held up one of those from 15 years ago to, to compare to that. It'd be la it's laughable kind of technology. And the point is, like, society is on this arc of progress and learning. And in an intellectual industry like investing, that really, really applies. And consultants have created this kind of like, you, whatever you set out to do 15 years ago, You've got to do that until the, literally the day that you die, or we're going to give you a sell recommendation, which means your firm's going to die. Yeah. And so there's this inertia, which drives me mad. And so what I, we lean 180 degrees in the other direction, and we want to hold managers accountable to improving every year. And so hmm. we, you know, we'll ask questions like, well, what have you done to improve in the last 12 months? And if the initial reaction is you know, a grab of the... Uh, you, you know they're probably not naturally ingrained into their process. So we try and partner with, the, with managers like that. We try and really isolate where we think that manager has an edge. Generally, an edge comes in three different ways, we think. It's either kind of an, an analytical or a research edge in, in that they just they go very deep into an industry. They have a very differentiated view that is generally you know, longer than the sell side or the market. And they, they're very disciplined and they'll stick to that over the long run. And they drive lots of good positive performance from something called security selection. It's a lot of discretionary managers. They typically come in more concentrated fashions, do that. So analytical or research edge. And the second one is either a data and technology edge. And this is becoming more prevalent, I would say at the moment. You know, the world is shifting so quickly with what's available to whom and how you can use data and technology to either replace or critically, I think, augment 
some certain, if you like, human discretionary endeavors and managers that lean into data and technology and keep investing in that, I think have a sustainable, you know, we think have a sustainable edge. And so we've got, an ex we've got, you know, managers where we would say that's what they do really, really well. And then the last one is like, they have a, a process, excuse me, if I can speak, a process edge, which is where they, they maybe carve themselves out some niche in the market that others aren't really doing and they're just doing it really freaking well yeah and they just they they stick to that like and they just figure out ways that they can just deliver that same process better year after year after year and i think actually um quantix and that case study i gave you that would be a really good example of where we've built something that just has a process edge versus other commodity investors and bcom and year after year after year, we're going to keep doubling down and making sure that process edge stays ahead of the competition. Hmm. Yeah, that's the moat, for lack of a better term, and, and yeah, the thing to continue work. to work on. Uh, yeah, it's a great. It's, it's exactly that, and we we do use that. We use what is the margin of safety or the moat around this manager, hmm. because you know, c capitalism is a is a wonderful system. It's not perfect, but if something's doing well. In yeah, it tends industry, to attract talent. It's going to attract talent. It's going to attract capital. And eventually that thing is going to be eroded away unless you keep investing in it and staying ahead. And that applies equally, if not more so, to the actual discipline of investing as much as it does to businesses like Apple that you might invest in. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Cool. Well, I like that. I, I, how many ETFs? Does it, it seemed to me like you had a lot. I, I have a quick question about happy, the happy index. Do you think that people are happy at firms that outperform because the firm is outperform like the stock is outperforming and therefore the employees are happy? Or do you think happy employees drive the stock outperformance? Uh, okay, so uh, uh, let me explain. Can I spend a minute? Or yes, a hundred percent. I just asked something that no one has any background on. So please. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. So, you're, <laughs> so we have we have two ETFs with kind of the happy moniker, HAPY and HAPI. So happy with a Y, happy with an I, and we uh, these are behavioral finance ETFs, and we partnered with an amazing researcher called Dan Ariely. Dan is the James B. Duke Professor of Psychology and Behavioral Economics at Duke University. Oh. And he is a, a multi-time New York Times bestselling author. He wrote the book that kind of brought him into the mainstream was back in 2008 called Predictably Irrational. Huh. And it's actually in the process of being turned into a, a, an NBC series. So Predictably Irrational. And Dan is a behavioral economist and he, he's sort of, thing is we're all less rational than we care to admit and he's an expert in decision making and he's an expert in motivation and he's created a research firm about six years ago to measure engagement and employee engagement in businesses and to see if there's a link between employee engagement and future equity performance and he they the firm is called irrational capital and they've coined a new investment factor called the human capital factor, right? And we, our ETFs, track that human capital factor. And the, the thesis is, and I'll, you know, ultimately your listeners have got to decide whether or not they like it, but the thesis is every business leader in any industry says the following. Our number one asset or our most important asset is what? Our, our people. people. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Like now they say it because it's tr true. And if you think about investing and you think about ac accounting, people are not capitalized on a balance sheet as an asset, right? How can they be? Like how, how on earth do you measure that, right? Property factories and plants and stuff like that kind of goes onto balance sheets right physical tangible assets and you know we'd argue that in the knowledge economy in which we kind of you know we're in now that accounting rules are pretty antiquated and there's things that are missed off balance sheets so the value of brand is one 
R and D is not captured on balance sheets and the value of people is not captured on balance sheets. And it's not, they're not captured because either accounting rules are out of date or they're just really hard to measure. And so we think we found with Dan and with a rational capital, a way of measuring this. And this would definitely fall into the camp of an alpha edge of data and technology. So they've spent about the last six years collecting you know, millions upon millions upon millions of data points about engagement in the workplace at publicly traded companies in the US. And they use a combination of proprietary data sets, which is based on kind of in survey and sentiment data, which they get. And they combine that with things like Glassdoor to see what people are saying. And then they've created a, uh, a number of underlying factors that measure the degree of corporate engagement or employee engagement. It's not all about happiness. You know, the t- we want to have fun with tickers. Yeah. So, we, you know, we called it happy, but it, what it, it's actually much more about engagement and finding businesses that have the highest degree of engagement by employees. Yeah, that makes sense. Who, which workforces are bought into the mission of the business. It, exactly. Because yeah. I'm, I, I, let me ask a question of your listeners, which is a hypothetical one, because I can't hear what they're going to say. But like, let's go through a quick thought experiment. What percent less effort could you put into your job today before you got fired? All right now, the answers range I've heard 30 to 70 percent is kind of the range I've heard when I've asked this question. A person at 30 should know that it's closer to zero and they're on the cusp. But anyway, (laughs) exactly. It's called overconfidence bias, buddy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, totally. Um, So. And but then you ask the question, well, why don't you? And people start going, well, you know, I like where I work and, you know, I've got a great boss. So I believe in the mission of my company. So you sort of start backward engineering some of these things that are really, really important. And then what you want to do is you want to measure these things systematically at scale using data. And I don't have the capability to do that. But Dan Ariely, who's been a psychologist and a behavioral economist for, for 30 years, does. And so we partner with them and they provide the research for the companies that score best. Oh, that's on this neat. And then we have an ETF that tracks that. And it, you know, we would describe this as a, a new investment factor. It's a fundamental investment factor. And we would believe that it is indicative of future performance, not explanatory, explanative, if that's a word, of past yeah, yeah. performance. And we did this the way that you look at the, mod, the way the models are created, they're created in what's called an out of sample kind of back test. So it's using historical data to then predict the future that the historical data doesn't know and then repeating that process. And then when I first looked, I thought this sounded like. Sounds like marketing mumbo jumbo is what yeah, it sounds exactly. like. Yeah, exactly. It sounds like marketing mumbo jumbo and it's all like soft and fluffy. But then we actually did the work and I thought what we were going to see is I thought we were going to see momentum and quality and a small cap effect show up. Interesting. And then, and then the rest would be kind of like a wash. Yeah. yeah. Generally generally those factors do pretty well. So we looked at 10 plus years of data that some might argue that's not long enough, but you know, that's what we have. So we looked at it and actually about 60% of the factors, excess returns, as in the human capital factors, excess returns, 60 to 70% were idiosyncratic hmm. and about 30 to 40 were loadings on factors. So even though we call it a factor for the super geeks out there, we would describe this as an idiosyncratic factor, hmm. mixing, mixing my metaphors a little bit. But um, ultimately, if you were to able to upload this data to a risk system, the risk system will tell you this was a factor and it was called the human capital factor. But because it doesn't exist, because no one has this data, it's the unexplained bit from risk models, so it shows up as idiosyncratic. Neat. So I, I, I went into this. Re- look, part of being an investor like me is to be cynical and skeptical, and it's to pass up on a lot more than you look at. And so when I um speak, I want to look. I probably look at a hundred managers for every one that we invest in. And this one, when I learned about it, look, I'm I'm intellectually curious, and as I explained at the beginning. You've got to keep looking forward that, you know, the world is not this static, it's a deeply dynamic and changing place. And 
new data, new theories come along. So I looked at this with a, with a skeptical, but tried to be open-minded. We spent about 18 months looking at it and, and we've concluded strongly that we think this is a legitimate factor and it's a, exploiting an inefficiency in the market. And you know we're, we're gonna be launching a small cap version, HAPS, H-A-P-S, in um, the middle of April. And uh, that looks quite promising as well. Oh, that's cool. That's, that's, I think that's, uh, I think those are two good, you know, that, what is the word I'm looking for? Examples of, of how you work. I, I, now that I'm on a podcast, I pay a lot of attention to how I talk. And yeah. I used to go, uh, a lot. And now that I yeah. don't go, uh, as much, I have these moments where my brain says, say something and I have to consciously shut my mouth. It's very difficult. Anyway. I, I digress, but I've noticed that. <laughs> mine, mine is, uh, you know, I say that all yeah. the time, which I, I, everybody hates listening back to themselves. But they, they are non-traditional, I would say, kind of creative ways of bringing investor returns to the marketplace. But we do have, you know, uh, there we go, I just said it, I just noticed. You know, <laughs> yeah, it gets um, in your head, right? <laughs> exactly. We, but we, we have... Another investor that we work with, Sea Worldwide in Copenhagen, they run a concentrated stock portfolio, 30 stocks, private equity mindset in public markets, ultra long-term time horizon, and a phenomenal track record going back to like 1986. And but an exceptional money manager. So we, we have differing degrees of like traditional approaches, but I think to, to try and create value, you have to think creatively. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I think that's cool. And I'm really glad that we had this conversation. I, I was admittedly a little bit skeptical because some of bit of the happy stuff, like I, I was kind of like, I don't know where this is going to go, but I have really enjoyed it. And I think that you've demonstrated, I, I really like how you talk about how you how you talked about i think this is going to basically be three factors and whatever and then the the work that goes behind dis i, I don't know that i want to say disproving that hypothesis yeah. because i i don't i don't want to frame i don't want to misspeak on your process but i like that you were open minded and did the work behind it and said you know what maybe there's something there is a here here and i think that's neat i i, I think your your wording's actually spot on so what well, i didn't mention this but we'll start with the hypothesis that all excess returns is luck. Prove me otherwise. Yeah, but that's the that's the framework that we, that we um that we actually start with. So yeah, you you nailed it. All right, cool. Well, uh, I you know I've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it. Enjoy Chicago. If I'm up there this summer, I'll look you up. I wouldn't mind grabbing a cup of coffee or a beer or something like that. But yeah, we'll uh, I'm not go, coming go, up we'll, in the winter. I assure you of that. <laughs> go. We'll go up to we'll go up to Wrigley. And, yeah, it'll be uh, fun. Go catch a Cubs game. It'll be awesome. But look. That was, uh, thanks for listening to me. That was super fun. And, uh, you know, I hope your listeners got something from it. And, I'm certain and they did. Enjoyed what they heard, but thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, man, you're good on the mic. You can come on anytime. Awesome. All right, thank have you. a good one, Christoph. Cheers. Thank you, Bob. <laughs>